welcome to My Deal History Films. I have made several films on history events that took place in Deal and what the town was like in those long ago days. I have tried to give different accounts of history in each film with many pictures of the old town passing by along with a narration. More information can be found on my website. Just type David's Garden into your browser and look for the Wix website. In the History of Deal Part 1, I'm going to give you a brief description of myself and my family history in connection with Deal in Kent. Many pictures have been included. My name is David Scarden. I was born in 1948 and raised in 6 Brewer Street, Deal, son of Jim Scarden. My great-great-grandfather is mentioned in the History of Deal book. It is stated that he was the surgeon to the Downs in the mid-1800s under the king at the time. He was apparently renowned for his sea sickness when working at sea on the warships. He operated from the bottom of Griffin Street from what was the old dustpan stores, now called Machine Mart. My granta, Robert Scarden, was born on the 24th of November, 1883, and lived in Sandown Road, where he once had a laundry which used to take in washing from the barracks along with selling fish and owning a lugger on the beach by the marina. Bob Scarden was the founder of Scarden's North Deal Band, which used to frequent the streets at the beginning of the 20th century. The full story can be heard in one of my other films. My grandfather, George Scarden, Robert Scarden's brother, was born on the 24th of July 1884 and owned the property in Middle Street, and also 6 Brewer Street which is where the fish business was run from. He was mentioned in dispatches during the First World War for bravery, seen here in the certificate. George was a fishmonger and served the country community with fish from his horse and cart for many years. My grandfather George married Edith Maud Hayward she was born in the Tyneball Tower, daughter of Isaac Gammon Hayward, watchmaker, that resided in the Tyneball Tower at that period. He was at one time Mayor Adil, and his brother was Thomas Hayward, the boat builder. My father Jim Scarden was born on the 27th of December 1926 in Six Brewer Street and on growing up had many adventures, all which are told in my other films. Jim, as he was known, married Molly Button. She was well known for her artistry and paintings, having shown once in the Tate Gallery. Jim ran his fish business from here and also, as well as owning a piece of land in Sandown Road, at the time bought Courtmarsh Farm alongside where Hutchins Timber Yard now stands and backing onto the old potteries. The fish business was carried on in Brewer Street until my father retired. He also kept and reared hundreds of hens for eggs, turkeys, capons, rabbits and pigs for the cr Christmas trade. As well as being one of the most well-known curers of herring, the bloaters selling far afield. I spent most of my younger days over the beach helping Tommy and Harry Upton winding boats up on the old hand winches for three pence a week. Lots of good times were had and many memories and events took place in those good old days. Too many to talk about here. South Goodwin was a really bad disaster. I was five years old and remember sitting around the old table in the kitchen and Dad had the old valve radio set switched on. It was really a wicked night. This is the early morn, wrecked off the Isle of Wight. She was lost with all hands. I followed the fishing line and when I was a young'un, at around seven years old plus, I used to go out netting for Huss with my dad in the Mary Ann and a little later on did this on my own. I went afloat in Bob Abel's boat, the Bridgette, with Johnny Revel, Nutty as he was called. There's many a night he has come down Brewer Street, 
drunk and struggling to stand up and shouted out aloud under my bedroom window, Titty, that's what he nicknamed me, Titty, get down here, we're going to float. My dad used to come up and get me up. I'd wander up the beach and the two of us would get the herring nets in the bridget and get afloat. The first thing old Nutty did when we were afloat was to drop his trousers and long johns and relieve himself before we got shot away. That's putting the herring nets in the sea, for those of you not familiar with boatman's terms. I've had many a clonk across the back of the head with an oar for not working hard enough, but Nutty caught fish, as drunk as he was, and I was always back ashore in time for school, but I don't remember much coming f- money coming forth though. Leaving school, I worked for Bob Abel in Middle Street, Dill Marine Craft, where I took my boat building apprenticeship, working from seven in the morning till six at night, six days a week for one pound 10 shillings, then going afloat at night, fishing to earn more money. I left boat building and at 15 years old was offered a job at Old Park Barracks as a boatman for the Royal Engineers for the sum of 12 pounds a week. This couldn't be refused. A vast increase in income. My job was teaching the Royal Engineers to handle boats and many other activities. Easy work when I look back now but not used to, I wasn't used to sitting around and soon became bored of the job. I was in the boathouse on Dover seafront one day when shoals of mackerel were schooling in the harbour. My mind wandered back to fishing and I eventually handed my notice in and returned to the beach. A bad mistake looking back now. Growing up, I worked on the beach for years and I am the youngest person to hold a first class boatman's A licence at the age of 14 having took my test with Captain McConnell. Having, during the part of these years, had the boats Mary Ann, Dauntless, a sailing punt square rigged with main and mizzen dipping lug saws, the Fair Chance, which was Tommy's, uh, Tommy Upton's old mini ha-ha. Dad rebuilt her down the farm, and she now lies in the museum in St George's Road, along with the surviving instruments of Bob's Garden's band. We had Harry Meekin's old Lady Beatty, which was renamed the Fairway, she was wrecked under Dill Pier in the late 1960s during a storm. Having had enough of angling parties and commercial fishing, as the rewards were not great, I left the beach in 1968 and went deep sea on a trawler called the St Rose out of Lowstuff. This was three months out and three days home. Hard work and poor pay. Another long story. So I returned home, got married and worked on trawlers out of Ramsgate, eventually buying a trawler of my own. Returning to the beach in 1970, I bought the motorboat Spray, the R11, and we were positioned on the beach opposite the Tyneball Tower, running the boat commercial fishing only with Richard Smith as my crew, who sadly has passed the bar at a young age. The Goodwin Sands were a great part of my life as well, as many a night we have spent out there netting and longlining for dogs and skate, spent it all night working the banks, just Dick Smith and myself. Some really eerie things have happened out there, and some cannot be explained. But unless you've been there, you can't really explain some of the strange things that used to happen. The storm of 1978 saw Dick and myself saving most of the boats along the beach of Dill. It was an eerie, flat calm night. We were long lining at the time. The spray was lowered down and baited lines were aboard ready for launching. I think high tide was around midnight. The tide was extremely low for four hours before high water and the sea was like a sheet of glass and not a breath of wind in the air. It was around 8 p.m. We were discussing the unusual state of the tide when heavy swells started rolling in from the north. We hove the spray up a couple of lengths and hung on for an hour. 
The sea was still like glass, but the swells had become really heavy. A wind from the north was starting to freshen quite fast. Dick and I decided to give the night a miss as the weather was deteriorating. In the time it took us to heave the spray back onto her beds at the top of the beach, the wind had freshened to a full-blown gale. The sea breached the high water bank at around 10.30pm. There were boats lying on top of the bank, so we went along and pulled these up to safety. By 11am the sea had breached the sea wall and many boats were in danger of getting destroyed. There was nobody about, only us, so we started pulling boats up onto the promenade and across the road to safety. Huge swells were running across the road and our task was getting impossible. I jumped in my van and drove to Dad's farm in Albert Road, where I got his tractor and a chain and returned to the beach. Arriving back at the beach, my dad and Ben Bailey had arrived on the scene and a frantic effort was made to pull the boats across the road to safety. Without the tractor, many would have been destroyed. It was around 1.30 in the morning and a severe gale was raging. One boat, belonging to Hooley, was chained and padlocked to her moorings. We hadn't realised this and whilst trying to move her, a huge swell came in, picked the tractor up off its wheels and threw it into a lamppost, bending it. If it hadn't been for this lamppost, I think me and the tractor would have met a bad end. My boat, the Spray, was the last to be moved, but before we could pull her to safety, a sea ran in, picked her up and threw her into the winch, knocking the winch over and damaging the port quarter. Early morning, around 4am, Jim in the lobster pot calf called us along and made us hot tea and sandwiches. We were soaked and frozen. We sat in the calf watching the sea breach the silly wall that had been built on the seafront. The sea came rushing over this wall, hit the houses and tried to return seaward, but was stopped by the wall. Hence, it returned and ran down into the high street, causing much flooding. The pictures of floods were taken on my old brownie camera. They are not good, but I was lucky to have a camera in those days. The beach was cleared up over the next few weeks and the spray was repaired. I eventually sold up over this in 1978 and took up a fish round, serving the country villages for some 10 years. Still fishing at Ramsgate on a trawler weekends and many more adventures happened. I returned to the beach in the year 2000 and built the St David for my son Andrew. She was sold and went to Holland. I then built the St Rose in my garden in Ripple, eventually selling her to a fisherman in Fraserburgh. A few pictures of shipwrecks and the old town follow. This is a picture of the Caliva, which went ashore at the north end up near the Coast Guard station. The Cabinda was wrecked on the Goodwin Sands, where hundreds of other unfortunate vessels are founded. The Helena Majesta was wrecked on the Goodwin Sands as well. She was full of lead ore. I can't remember how much, but she had two German stowaways on board as well. The Costa Nora. Most of you all know what happened to her, so I won't go into details here but the full story can be seen in Deal's History Part 3, My Father's Recollections, where more pictures and an on-the-day account of the time can be heard. These old pictures and photos really speak for themselves. There is not much you can say about them. There are many pictures on my website and pictures and stories are always wanted if you have something you would like to share. Deal, when I was younger, was a quaint old town, full of old characters and full of old charm. Not like it is today. Many people say Deal is unspoilt and is a lovely place, but that's their view, not mine. I hope you have enjoyed watching this film. This is a small portion of the history of Deal. There is much more of old Deal in my other films. I am trying to keep history alive for future generations. Visit my website for more pictures and stories. Just type in David Scarden into your browser. My book, Tom's Adventures at Sea, is also available in print or download. It is written on actual happenings, 
set in the early 1900s. Thank you for watching.